All right, and here we go. I'm just decodesearcher.com. Welcome, everybody. I'm here today with Doug Camp, uh, and we're going to be talking about a few things that we see going on uh, in the world today with uh, some, some doctrines that have popped up, so, some teachings of Marcion, um, some rightly dividing issues. Doug, have you seen what's happening? Absolutely. Hey, it's great to be with you. Thanks for having me. And, um, you know, I, I think, you know, we're seeing some of the symptoms of uh, seeds that were planted a very long time ago. And uh, I, I believe that when we kind of talk about this phenomenon of rightly dividing the word of truth, uh, you know, that really that is a very, that's a, it's a, a dispensational catchphrase. And, you know, what they're saying, just for people that may not know what that really means, is that, you know, hey, not everything in the Bible is for you. You've got to rightly divide it. You have to... Um, you know, be able to interpret what is for me and what is for somebody else. Okay. And to some extent, there's, there's a bit of truth to that. I mean, when, when Nathan confronted David, he wasn't confronting me. All right. But on the other hand, the application that David received most clearly uh, is for me as well. Okay. Uh, when, when God made promises specifically to David, that he would be the father of the Messiah. Well, that's obviously not to me because I'm not in that lineage. So, you know, in that sense, I need to rightly divide as they would say, but, but we're not talking really about those kind of issues. What, what they're going to say is that when it comes to rightly dividing, there's, you know, they would even, some of the more extreme would even say that many of the teachings of Jesus, our, our Lord and King and our savior uh, do not apply to us because he was speaking to the Jews and not to me. And so, therefore, what happens is they'll say, well, Paul is our apostle. Paul is our spokesperson. And what he says does not apply to me. And this kind of thinking really goes back to a guy named Marcion. Marcion was a second century heretic. Uh, he was uh, a really bad dude. He was uh, from uh, Sinope, which is in modern day Turkey. And he gave us such terms as the Old Testament versus the New Testament. Uh, you know, you ever wonder where do those terms come from? Well, they come from Marcion. Uh, this obsession with Paul and Paul only, Marcion, okay? Uh, the divorce of law and grace, that goes back to Marcion as well. So Marcion is really the guy, I mean, I've traced it back as far as him. I cannot see anybody else that was was influential like he was. There may have been other people that, you know, inspired him, but he was definitely the one who kind of codified it and then continued to promote this idea. And the, the crazy thing is that few people have ever heard of Marcion. Uh, he's one of these ghosts, you know, in our past that we don't even realize uh, who, he, who he was and what he actually did. You know, we think, when we think about heretics, we think about uh, you know, Arius and, you know, kind of the, the father, if you will, of the, the Jehovah's Witnesses. And, um, you know, we think of Pelagius, you know, semi-Pelagianism and all these, these different people throughout church history who have had some, what we would call aberrant doctrines. Uh, but, but few people have ever heard of Marcion. In fact, uh, he's really not even talked about, um, which, you know, is kind of surprising, but it goes back to him. And I, I did a teaching recently called Haunted Theology. In fact, I'll just, I'll, I'll bring that up so I can uh, show people um, if they want to check that out. Uh, this is on my YouTube channel, Haunted Theology. It's not about Halloween, okay? But uh, it was a nice little motif, all right? But it's how the modern church is haunted by the ghost of Marcion, Marcion who caused a divorce of God's commands from his grace, all right? And so... Uh, in this in this presentation, I, I talk about uh, the various things that happen, and so just you know the same idea of the haunted house. It's being perceived as being inhabited by disembodied spirits of the deceased, who may have uh, been former residents. So too, we have a haunted theology. It's inhabited by a spirit of the second century Mar Mar uh, heretic named Marcion. Okay, and so you know you got these examples that are just. You know, it's like taking your fingernails to the chalkboard for me. You know, I see that, you know, Jesus nailed the old law to the cross. And you, there you've got the Ten Commandments, um, you know, behind nailed to the cross. cross. And so this is where this comes from, from Marcion. 
Yes. I did not realize that. Yes. Well, this, this, this notion that, that he, that, you know, this nail, the law was nailed to the cross is absolutely antithetical to what Jesus said. And it goes back to this guy, you know? And so, you know, this guy says that conclusively, um, conclusively without any doubt, um, that the entire law, that is the law of Moses, the 10 commandments, including the Sabbath was abolished, passed away and cast out. I mean, wow. Right. And then I included a meme here, or not a meme, but a, uh, a screenshot from somebody who sent me uh, this word. And she says that I'm a Gentile, so Paul is my apostle. The law of the Old Testament and the four Gospels don't apply to me. Mm. I don't worship on Saturdays. I don't slaughter lambs when I sin. And I am free to obey the Lord because of love, not law. All right? Mm. So, you, so there you see this, this, uh, this sentiment that people have that you know, that uh, the, you know, the first two-thirds or three-fourths of their Bible does not apply to them. And even the Gospels, right? You're like, wait a second, Jesus must apply to you. No, no, Jesus doesn't. The teachings of Jesus do not apply. Certainly the sacrifice, they would clearly say the sacrifice of Jesus. But as far as the, uh, the teachings of Jesus do not apply to us, what? I mean, this is ridiculous, right? Yes, and, yes. you know, so, so Marcion... He rejected the entire uh, Hebrew Bible, also known as the Tanakh or the Old Testament. Uh, he rejected all of that because it was Jewish. He rejected the four Gospels, except he did take parts of Luke, and the parts that looked Jewish or sounded Jewish or had a reference to a Jew, he cut those out. He literally took his scissors, and he cut those out of his text. So his, the entirety of his Bible was portions of Luke, and then 10 of the epistles of Paul. Uh, three of them were not in there. First, second, Timothy and Philemon, if memory serves, or maybe either Philemon or, or Philippians, but memory serves me. But I think it's Philemon. But in any event, um, he, those were not in his Bible. And so now you, you kind of get this idea. And I'm, you know, when I first discovered this, I'm like, wait a second, I've heard this sermon before, right? Uh, I've gone to churches where every week Paul says, Paul says, Paul says, Paul says, and you're like, okay, look, I love Paul, you know, great guy, but Paul did not die for my sins. Paul did not create the world. Paul did not dictate what's supposed to happen. Paul did not tell me how to live my life. You know, Jesus is the guy for me, right? right. Jesus is the one who was the, who was the word incarnate, who took on flesh, who went to the cross, who died and rose again. Hallelujah. That's the one that I serve, okay? Because he was before all things. And as John said, that I'm unworthy to untie his, the straps of his sandals, right? Because he was before me. That is the one that we serve. He's the one that we pledge allegiance to, not Paul. And, and I'll tell you, I've shared that with some people <laughs> here and there. And I've gotten this look of disgust, like, how could you possibly say that? You know, like I just spit on their mother's grave or something. And, you know, they're like, well, wait a second. How could you say this? Paul's the greatest thing ever. And I'm like, look, I love Paul, but Paul is not my savior. He is not my savior. And I do not pledge allegiance or loyalty to Paul. And so Paul needs to conform to what Jesus said. And I believe that Paul did, in fact, conform to what Jesus said. It was misunderstood and still misunderstood today. That's right. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so, you know, kind of the, uh, the issue that, that you brought up of, uh, you know, rightly dividing the truth, the, the word, uh, you know, obviously Paul said that. And, and I, and again, I agree with everything that Paul said, but I think that Paul's been misinterpreted and I think right. his words have been twisted so that now we're, what happens is we, we have Paul and we pit Paul against the, the old covenant, you know? And so now you've got Paul who's, who's giving this message of liberation from the old covenant, from the old Testament, from, you know, let's call it the, 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 the Tanakh, right? The Torah, the Nevi'im, the Ketuvim, right? The Hebrew Bible. And, and so there's this sense that, you know, that nobody else had that. Nobody else understood what Paul was really getting at. Um, you know, that, that Paul alone knew the truth. And that is just absolutely disgusting. You know, um, I don't know how else to put it and, or to put it very nicely, but it's such an aberrant doctrine. 
Uh, let me just share another thing with you that, um, uh, you know, this has kind of definitely gotten some media attention. This is uh, Andy Stanley. And uh, Andy Stanley says that the Old Testament was not the go-to source regarding any behavior for the church. That's right? insane because Paul, even the disciples, they were quoting from the other, other side. Exactly. Right. <laughs> You know, so how did this happen? <laughs> you know, and then he goes on. He says, first century church leaders unhitched the church from the worldview, value system, and regulations of the, notice, Jewish scriptures. Peter, James, Paul elected to unhitch the Christian faith from their Jewish scriptures. And my friends, we must as well. Wow. Where did this come from? You know, and he's not the only guy to say this. Um, you know, we have the likes uh, actually, uh, Albert Muller is, is uh, uh, defending against what Andy Stanley was saying. I won't go into that right now. But we have uh, Joseph Prince, who is, who is kind of saying the same thing. He says, you cannot put law or grace and law together, right? And you're like, wait a second. <laughs> Notice he says, the law is not for you, the believer. It's not for you, the believer. And uh, I have another guy who quoted, you know, says the law is a unit comprised of 613 commandments and all of it has been rendered inoperative. There's no commandment that has continued beyond the cross of the Messiah. Oh my goodness. Right. I mean, this is just, oof. Uh, it kind of makes you sick, right? Yeah. Um, because, you know, the way I see it, Yeshua came fulfilling the sacrificial law uh, and, and all of what the, the prophets prophesied about the Messiah coming. This is the good news that supposedly uh, that the New Testament is, is affirming. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's really hard to kind of put your mind around how deep this goes. So Marcion was this guy. He, he was born in Pontius uh, or in Sinope. Uh, in the uh, the bigger region of Pontius, uh, born around 85, died 160. And some of the epithets for this guy, he was called the ravening wolf, filthy swine, the dreadful blasphemer. blasphemer. <laughs> and and uh, by uh, 150 AD, his heresies had spread to the whole human race, according to Justin Martyr. Hmm. And according to Tertullian, Marcion's heretical tradition had filled the whole world. All right, so... These so the the heresiologists were trying to stamp this guy out, even though he was dead for the most part. Um, you know he 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 continued to until about five hundred. His real influence continued till about five hundred, and uh, even so Spread much like so. Wildfire. What, right. It really yes exactly. Even so much so that even by five fifty two, there's this guy Mark uh, named Mar Abba who was a fanatical pagan. And he was attempting to cross the Tigris, and he was he brought to see the light of um, of uh, a miracle and an ensuing conversation with a Christian ascetic, whose surname was Moses. And so he wanted to know whether uh, this guy Joseph uh, was uh, Joseph Moses was an Orthodox, a Marcionite, or a Jew. And um, and what happened is uh, the guy says, "No, I'm a." He says, "Are you a Christian?" He says. Uh, yes. Do you worship Messiah? Yes. And so he's like, how can you be a Jew, a Christian, and a worshiper of the Messiah all at the same time? And the trouble is, is that the term Christian had uh, been supplanted. It had been kind of hollowed out and filled in with Marcionism. So when you said Christian, people thought, oh, Marcion. Okay. And, and that's, the, that's the crazy danger, is that uh, the, two, the two terms had become synonymous. And so if you said you're a Christian— they thought you were a Marcionite. And, I mean, just imagine, that's 500, 555, 552. Uh, and, and so <laughs> the, the confusion that has been going on for now, you know, roughly 1,900 years. And this is the enemy because when, when Satan realized what had happened after the, the resurrection, because, you know, the, the prophet spoke cryptically. Isaiah didn't give the game plan in, in his writings. He spoke cryptically. Satan didn't know about this. Had he known, he wouldn't have killed the Messiah. But after the fact, after the damage has been done to hell, right? Mm -hmm. Satan has to work overtime 
to gain ground. And so what does he do? He decides if I can't deceive him, if I can't kill him, I got to lead him. And so he hijacks the way through the Roman Catholics. And, and from that point is a continuous myth manipulation and perversion of the way, uh, mm -hmm. continually That's eroding, right. eroding more and more away. Um, and now, you know, here in 2000 years later, we're seeing Marcion and people actually saying, you only need 13 books. The rest of it doesn't apply to you. Yep. Um, yep. You know, but what, what about, what about the thief on the cross right next to Yeshua's? His only requirement to being saved is Yeshua, remember me when you go into your kingdom. And Yeshua mm -hmm. says, uh, this day truly you will be with me. The thief yeah. didn't know the first thing about Paul. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it was just a matter of belief, his faith that this was and is the Messiah. Yep. Uh, it was all re required. That's right. Yeah, and, 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 and belief, you know, I think this is really important to, to uh, point out, is that belief is always an action word. Okay, it's always an action word. Uh, now, given his current, his, circ his circumstances, the thief on the cross couldn't do anything, right? He, right. Couldn't, uh, he couldn't actually live that out. But Right, but my point is, yeah. th there are some today that are saying you can't be saved without Paul in the 13 mm. books that he wrote. It's impossible. I, I saw that. Yeah. It's That's impossible true. to be saved, and I highly disagree with that because yeah. there are people that didn't have access to Paul um, that, that found salvation through Yeshua. And so it doesn't make any sense that you cannot find salvation unless you have Paul. Um, mm -hmm. Well, and there's the kind of the, the Romans road. You know, that's, that's uh, a typical method that, you know, you have to lead people to Jesus through this presentation that is given by Paul. And, you know, it always becomes a very, a very tricky thing when we start talking about Paul, because it sounds to some like we're against Paul. Right. And I want to make it very clear. I'm not against Paul. I'm actually pro, very pro Paul. I believe everything that Paul said, but I think that Paul has been twisted. Yes. By person, by people like Marcion. And then that tradition has carried on so that without even realizing it, many pastors today, many evangelical uh, Baptist flavored uh, pastors are uh, teaching a form of Marcionism or semi Marcionism. Um, you know, so they're they're Yeah, they believe the entire Bible. They believe that, you know, they should definitely have the Old Testament in their Bible. But, but the reality is they'd say, well, yeah, we believe it. We're glad we have it because it tells us about Jesus. It tells us about the creation of the world and kind of tells us how much we need grace. All right. And, um, and it, it you know, makes us feel good because now we really see why we need the cross so much. Okay. And so, so that's why they have it. But in as far as, insofar as the, the, the Tanakh has any type of uh, authority over your life, they would say, well, of course not. I mean, that, you know, the things that, the, the writings that have authority for me, the things that I'm actually supposed to do, would be only in the letters of Paul. And that is truly, uh, it's, just, it's, it's truly uh, shameful uh, and very saddening as well. Uh, Angela Tilby in her book, Heresies and How to Avoid Them, she says, for Marcion, there was a fundamental contradiction between law and grace, righteousness, or excuse me, law and love and righteousness and grace, right? So, you know, again, this is the, the, the idea, and I've heard this preached so many times, that, you know, the Old Testament, well, the whole idea of the dispensation of law, right? Uh, it's, and what, what comes after? The dispensation of grace, right? So you're like, well, of course there couldn't be really grace back in the dispensation of law. It was a dispensation of law. <laughs> And there can't be law in the dispensation of grace because it's the dispensation of grace. And this is the kind of thinking that fills pulpits around uh, America and, you know, potentially the world because a lot of uh, people have been very much influenced by teaching from the United States. Um, and, you know, what's also interesting is so if we kind of come forward from the time of Marcion, uh, into a more modern age, we come to the writings of C.I. Schofield. Yeah. And, you know, I was uh, looking through Schofield's notes and I was appalled, just absolutely appalled to see what he said. 
he, he said, um, this is in his um, Schofield reference notes, 1917 edition uh, in the Genesis 15 uh, entry. He says the fourth dispensation, that is the dispensation of promise, he says it ended when Israel rashly accepted the law in Exodus 19.8. And he says that grace had prepared a deliverer, Moses, and provided a sacrifice for the guilty and by divine power brought them out of bondage. But at Sinai, they exchanged grace for law. So the idea that they would rashly accept the law, you know, God says, you know, if you'll be my people and do what I tell you, I'll be your God. And they say, all that the Lord has said, we will do. Yeah. Right. And they, they had not, they had not, uh, committed any, any sin with the golden calf at this point. Uh, they hadn't done anything wrong except a little bit of whining, <laughs> but uh, you know, otherwise they were, they're like, yeah, let's, you got it, God, you're making us an offer. We accept. And he says that Israel rashly accepted the law and they exchanged grace for law. So this is the foundation of so many teachers who have this idea that there's an antithesis between grace and law. And I would suggest that grace and law are two sides of the same coin, you know, because law tells me how to live. Law tells me how to, to uh, interact with my, with my fellow human. Instructions. And, you know, and, and yeah, and sometimes we think that it's, well, it's, it's so prohibitive and it's keeping me from doing all these things. But you know what? Let's look at it from the other perspective. Law is also protecting me. Law is giving me confidence that I can walk down the street and I have a pretty good certainty that I'm going to make it to my destination because law is protecting me from thugs. Law is protecting me from murderers. Law is protecting me from, from bandits and et cetera. You know, it, it's not to say that people won't ever break it, but there is a law that says that you just can't do that. If you act in a certain way, you will be held accountable for your actions. You know, so if we think it's bad now, if we think we're in a lawless condition right now in America, and, and granted, we do see people being shot and lots of bad things, but imagine if we had no laws. Imagine if, if there, you know, there was no consequence for those kind of wrong actions, then people will do it all the more, right? Because they would not be constrained. So the law is actually a, a defense for the weak. It's a defense for the helpless. It's, it's, a, it's a form of love by constraining my neighbor who might not be so nice to me. And, you know, and so then, but then if I break the law, if I do something that's wrong, it turns out that there is grace. Or if the, you know, the other guy does something wrong, there is grace in, in times of when we, we go over that, that boundary and we do something that we're not supposed to do. So really grace and law go together. They're hand in hand because the very idea of grace, it, 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 it demands that there must be grace in relationship to something that you did that was wrong, right? So you wouldn't even know what grace was or what is the definition of grace if it were not for the instructions that God gave us. And, and so this is why I think we find ourselves sometimes just wanting to pull our hair out because we're like, the, our, our definitions have been so convoluted that, you know, you get into a conversation with somebody and they're saying this thing and you're saying the other. And, and, you know, they're just like, you're crazy because you're putting yourself back under law. And I can't believe you're trying to keep the old Testament and all this stuff. And, and you're like, no guys, I'm trying to help you understand that they're not antithetical. And so the trouble is we're not really, you know, having these arguments with people about the Bible. We're, we're trying to get through that filter of Marcion. Right. And because, the same thing. <laughs> and because most people on, on both sides of this, of this discussion don't even know who Marcion is, then we really can't put our finger on what is it we're actually divided about, you know? And, um, and, and that of course is the, the challenge and that's where we find ourselves. Incredible that even this, this long, almost 2000 years. Um, and we and uh, you're right. You can't put your finger on it because you don't know where the source is, what, what happened and where it came from. Um, but, but there are those throughout the line that kind of picked it up and, and even 
gave it uh, a rejuvenation in, in its life, like Schofield. Um, and I find it interesting that each one of these uh, that have done this, um, from Marcion to Schofield, are highly anti-Semitic, uh, which I saw this in uh, the, the, the brother on YouTube who has um, rejected anything Hebrew, anything Jewish. We don't want to Judaize, right? And has gone the, the full-on Marcion only, I could also call it hyperpaulism, where it's just 13 books that you need, uh, which mm -hmm. is just blows my mind that we're in this state today uh, mm -hmm. where the enemy is so cunning and mm -hmm. so good at deceiving people. He has convinced them um, to throw away three quarters of the book and not mm -hmm. even consider it. Um, the, the King James onlyist. Um, mm -hmm. Again, the, the same person says, if you don't, if you don't have the King James, you don't, don't know that the word is rightly dividing um, mm -hmm. because in, in other places it's, it's, it's a, a you know handling the word appropriately, um, not mishandling the word when um, when you're interpreting. Um, but only in the King James it says rightly dividing, and uh, the blame was thrown off. I've been using the wrong Bible. Uh, I've been deceived by this Judaized Bible, mm -hmm. and I found this to be just absurd. That that you know you throw the the whole restoration movement under the bus and that's why i see it uh, as a restoration back to the 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 hakala, the way mm -hmm. yeah so yeah, absolutely i you know and, and it's just it, it really it, it is very disturbing where we are but i guess the good news is we're beginning to see we're beginning to wake up uh and i believe that in and of itself is a work of the spirit that he's he's helping us to now discover some of these things and to slowly ever so slowly wake up and say wait a second why are we not keeping the entirety of god's word and i know for myself i you know i'm like now that i've seen it i'm like come on everybody should see this you know but we have to be be kind and gracious to people that uh, have just not you know they haven't arrived where we are yet and we haven't fully arrived either and so we just want to be kind and considerate to those who are still on the journey uh, as we're still on the journey and to to help them to see it, you know, but um, You know, and I you know, I think what happens is it, It's so easy to, to point fingers at you know at the the Pharisees, you know as the, those guys they were they were the, the big troublemakers, but you know the, the Pharisees of yesteryear are no really different than today's Catholics or today's Baptists or today's Presbyterians uh, or even my congregation, okay? Because what happens is we all start thinking, my way of looking at it is the only way to look at it. And if you're not doing it my way, then you're probably not saved, okay? And there's a real danger in that. And so the, 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 the challenge is to, first of all, realize that we all have a framework. The framework is how we view the scriptures. And when you're little, you, you know, your parents read the Bible or you go to you know, Sunday school or Shabbat, whatever, and you hear these stories and they're, they're told to you by way of a certain framework. And you don't, you don't even see the framework. You don't know that the framework exists. And then as you continue studying, you begin to realize, oh, there's a framework. And then you're like, well, yeah, and that's right, because the framework is correct. And uh, so for me, it was I grew up with a dispensational framework. I didn't know it existed. Uh, until I continued studying and then I began to learn about the framework and then I was like, yeah, the framework is awesome. It's the only framework. It's so much better than the other frameworks. And then I began to, to look for, um, uh, you know, support of this framework in the scripture and I couldn't find it. And, and that's where things started to break down for me. And I had to come to this place to uh, very courageously say, I'm going to let the framework go. And I say courageously, not because I'm so amazing, but because it's scary. It is. It's really scary to let go of your framework. Because what happens is, whether we admit it or not, the framework is our, it's, it's, it's our self-identity. You know, it's, this is who I am. Okay, because, you know, lots of us have the Bible, right? The Jews have the Bible. Uh, the Catholics have the Bible. Uh, the dispensationalists have the Bible. 
but it's my framework that makes me distinct from the Catholic and from the Jews because my framework says, well, this is how you're supposed to read it. And so because it's, it's your own identity, to let go of the framework is very scary because you're afraid that you might lose who you are. And, um, and so I had to come to that place because I kept saying to myself, now, where do I see this in Scripture? And I realized I don't see it in Scripture. And so I had to let go of it. But, you know, so it was scary. But the good news on the flip side is that once I, I let it go and I kind of grieved over that whole process because nobody wants to admit that they've been deceived. Nobody wants to admit that, geez, I've been hoodwinked. Um, but once I got over that, then all these other things just started to pop out of Scripture. And I'm like, oh, my goodness, this is beautiful. It's wonderful. God is so much bigger than I, uh, that my framework would let him be. Uh, he's so much more gracious. He's so much more kind. Um, you know, and, and on and on and on it goes. Uh, but then you also see some sides of, oh, but he actually is expecting me to do this. And he's expecting me to, you know, to, to be obedient. Okay. He's, you know, if I love him, I should be obedient to him. Right. And so it's both liberating, but it's also a little bit constraining in other areas where you, you let go of your certain framework. Uh, and let me just share, this is another thing from Schofield. Um, he says this in his reference notes. He says that grace is the kindness and love of God, our Savior, toward man. Okay, I agree with that. And he says, not by works of righteousness, which we have done. He quotes from Titus 3, 4, and 5. He goes on, it is therefore constantly set in contrast to law, under which God demands righteousness from man, as under grace he gives righteousness to man. All right. So he says, law is connected with Moses and works, grace with Christ and faith. Law blesses the good, grace saves the bad. Law demands that blessings be earned, grace is a free gift. Now, that kind of teaching is, is so dangerous because some of the things he or he's saying are, are true. The kindness of and love of God. Makes true. Yeah, you know, well, you know, God did save us, right? And, and we, we can never be righteous enough to earn God's favor, all right? And so I completely agree that we cannot earn God's favor, uh, you know, by, you know, not murdering somebody. Okay? Right. He's like, you know, well, of course you don't murder somebody, you know? And so realizing that we have favor with God because of his grace is incredibly important. But then he, he contrasts it, and he says it's constantly in contrast to law. And that God is demanding righteousness from man. But see, that is a false dichotomy. It's an absolute false dichotomy. Because it's not that God is demanding righteousness from man. Demanding for what purpose? In order to have a relationship with him. And see, that is the false uh, dichotomy that he's created. Think of it this way. Let's say I, uh, I'm you know, a good man and I decide to adopt a, uh, a foster child. Uh, this foster child has had many issues. You know, he's not been a great kid. Um, he's had a hard life. And so I adopt him and I tell him, you're, you're now my son. Okay. And I love you just because I adopted you. And, and so now he is legally mine. I'm to care for him and I love him and I do love him. Uh, but in his mind, he keeps thinking, I've got to earn my father's love. Right? And so he's always trying to do things. And whereas my natural born children aren't trying to do those things because they just, well, they know. They grew up in my house and I love them because I love them. Right? But this adopted child, he's now trying to earn this love. Until one day it occurs to him that he doesn't have to earn my favor. He already has my favor. All right? He has my favor because I adopted him. When I adopted him and signed those papers and, and did everything I needed to do to get him, that's when he already had my favor, right? And so now, as his father and he as my son, do I want him to obey? Of course I do, because I want him to get along with his brother and sisters. I want him to, um, you know, be a, a happy member of our family. You know, I don't want to always be correcting and disciplining and uh, punishing, you know, that doesn't bring me joy. And so when he's continually rebellious, I'm not happy about that. But he doesn't need to earn my favor because he already has my favor. You see? And so this is the part that dispensationalists are missing is that, yes, 
the favor is completely a gift. We cannot earn that. We don't deserve it. We don't work for it. But because we have our Father's favor, we want to be obedient because the obedience is good for us. It's good for our brothers and sisters. It's good for our relationship with our Father. And it's just plain good for me. And so that is why we keep his instructions, not because we're trying to earn anything from him, but because it's the right thing to do. Because it's how you live a blessed life is by keeping the Father's instructions. That's how you have a blessed life. And frankly, I kind of like a blessed life. I don't need to have you know, unnecessary uh, struggles if I don't need to. Amen. So, you know, why not just keep the Father's instructions and do these things? But, of course, the dispensationalist is, has been so um, indoctrinated with this idea that law and grace are two different things, utterly different, and that Jesus nailed the law to the cross, that any talk of the law or God's instructions, his Torah, it, 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 um, you know, it sends shivers up their spine and, and they just <laughs> they can't talk to you anymore. So uh, it's a real problem. I agree. It's, it certainly is. And, um, you know, I pray that, that yeah, more eyes are open in this awakening. Um, they, they bring us around, but it is a cunning deception. The enemy has crept in and is able to convince from the inside um, that, that, that being obedient is wrong, that you're actually working. I mean, this is just um, a, a trick of, of Satan to, to convince uh, believers of this. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, let me share this from, uh, this is from doctrine.org. Uh, it, it, it's, it's a little bit more uh, radical in their perspective, but what I, I would suggest that what they are saying here is what a lot of people are afraid to say, and they're just coming out and saying it. All right. Uh, so they say, and I quote, Jesus preached the kingdom of heaven. Paul did not. Paul preached justification by faith alone. Jesus did not. The messages of Jesus and Paul, get this, were fundamentally different. Reconciliation of their messages cannot be done by harmonization. This is a fact we must accept. And he goes on to say, Paul emphasized the church, the body of Christ. This terminology was entirely absent from the teaching of Jesus and the Twelve and unknown until the ascended Lord revealed it to Paul. It was new. Peter, James, John, Jude, etc. did not teach it and knew nothing of it until they learned it from Paul. Paul alone revealed and taught that the citizenship and position of believers in the body of Christ was heavenly, not earthly. For Paul, God's kingdom as related to the body of Christ was heavenly and wholly different from the earthly kingdom proclaimed by John the Baptist, Jesus, and the Twelve, end quote. All right, so Paul, ha- Paul and Paul alone had a teaching that was fundamentally different, fundamentally different from what Jesus was teaching. Now, think about this. Uh, let's just, you know, take it from a, uh, a CEO's perspective or, you know, a, kind of a, a leader of a business. Are you really going to go into a company and you're going to invest three and a half years of your life and you have this, this group of men or, and women around you and you're pouring into them, you're teaching them, you know, day after day, you're teaching them all of your insights and your secrets and how to have a successful business. And then you get, you go, you know, you take a sabbatical, right? And then you tell this other guy some other method of doing business, which is completely different from what you just invested three and a half years doing. And then that guy is going to go and tell the ones who spent all that time with you learning directly from the master. And, and now you're supposed to believe this other guy who was never there and just got this revelation. And now he has the truth, right? But this is the, the mentality that people have about Paul. And that's why Paul, uh, sadly, uh, becomes the default authority 
yeah. for the for the Christian, not Jesus, seen, not Jesus, but Paul. Even trumps him sometimes. I'm I'm seeing in some cases where um, they will cite Paul and Trump what Yeshua say, um, as if Paul had the final authority um, because Paul was given something new, um, mm -hmm. and, and it's just. It's just mind blowing. Um, yep. that people have, have arrived at this. Um, mm -hmm. I, I guess I can understand where you know the, from the deception, um, but personally, me, I just can't see it when I read. Um, I see Paul pointing us to the Torah. Uh, you know, he was he was not abandoning his um, his beliefs and, and his traditions. He actually kept. The feast he kept, he did as Yeshua did, and what did Yeshua do? He kept the feast, he kept the Torah, uh, and what he didn't keep was <laughs> the Talmudic laws, the the uh, the laws of the rabbis. This right. the requirements of you know you must put on your left sock first, and your left shoe first, and then your right shoe, and then your left uh, uh, right sock, and you. I mean, it's by the numbers. You're washing your hands in an order. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. These things that are added, right? These are the actual laws that Yeshua came against, not the Torah. And, and some Christians will say, "Well, you see, G Jesus came against the Torah. He was making fun of the Pharisees about washing hands and all this kind of stuff." And they think that this is in the Torah, and it's mm -hmm. not. This is a part of the Talmud, <laughs> right? Yeah. The the real problem is that they don't know the Hebrew Bible, right? They right. just don't know it. Um, there's a, a, a gross ignorance on the part of most Christians of the Hebrew Bible, uh, also known as the Old Testament. And, because, then, and why? Because, because the they've been from it. Yeah. Right. Because there's a bias against it. And I used to have that bias. I remember that. I used to have that very same bias thinking, well, you know, I'm sure there's great stuff to learn in there, but it's not really as good, you know. As the New Testament, the New Testament is a Christian thing. That's for us. And the Old Testament, while it has some great stuff, but it's really for the Jews. Uh, if, I, if I were on a deserted island and I, could, I had to choose between the Old Testament and the New Testament, what would I take? Well, of course, I would take the New Testament. You know, uh, you know these are the theoretical, hypothetical situations that people like to invent, and you've got to choose. Well, of course, I would choose the New Testament. You know, I think I, somebody even asked me that. You know, like, like, well, why are we even talking about hypothetical <laughs> situations of deserted islands and stuff? Because, you know, they're trying to get to this place of, well, this is what really matters, right? This is, this is what really matters. And, and that, and in the Jewish uh, terminology, we call that the halakha, and that is that which you walk by. Halakha means to walk or walking. And so, you know, what, you know, what, how do you actually, you know, live your life? What are, you know, the things that you do, uh, the laws that govern you, okay, not just theory, not just ideas, but what do you actually do and what must you do as a believer? And, uh, and so, what's, again, what's happened is they've thrown out the entire Tanakh. Where did this idea come from? Did it come from Paul? No, absolutely not. It came from this dude, Marcion, right? And he's an, I mean, it's just absolutely disgusting. Let me, let me just share something with you again. Um, this is from that same uh, teaching that I did called uh, Haunted Theology. And, uh, you know, I, get, I think the shock value is something that we need to just take a look at it. So this is from uh, Timothy S. Morton. Uh, he's got a, a website, Preserved Truth. And uh, he says, the New Testament did not begin until after the crucifixion. Get this. So the New Testament, the, the New Covenant, did not begin until after the crucifixion which is, I guess is true, and, and, but this, but, and all of the material found in the four Gospels applies doctrinally to Jews under Mosaic law. This is important to remember. Until Matthew 27, 50, when Jesus yielded up his spirit, etc., the Old Testament was still in full effect. So everything that is said before then must be placed in proper context, Thus, nearly everything, nearly everything Christ said before the cross applies doctrinally not to us Gentiles, but to the Jews in reference to their kingdom. 
talk about putting a wall of separation up between us, right? You know, didn't Paul say the walls come down? But no, we're putting this thing back up, man. And he says dispensationalism has the responsibility of clearly proclaiming the great differentiation between Jesus' kingdom gospel prior to Calvary and his post-cross heavenly gospel. If Paul's heavenly gospel were not other than that of Jesus' earthly kingdom gospel to Israel, he would naturally have been instructed by the apostles who had been with Jesus all during his earthly ministry. But on the contrary, uh, the apostles who had been taught by Paul concerning much of the new heavenly truth. My goodness. But, you know, he's not the only guy. Uh, so here we have uh, Douglas Stauffer. Now, again, I, I, I always want to be careful because I think Douglas Stauffer is a, a nice gentleman. I think he loves the Lord. Uh, I just happen to disagree very strongly with some of his uh, conclusions. And he wrote this in one book, Rightly Divided. Okay, so speaking of Rightly Dividers, um, uh, this is exactly what we're talking about. And so uh, Dr. Douglas Stauffer, very intelligent man. He's written 10 books. So, you know, he is uh, a, a, a voice that would, uh, you know, is kind of has some authority in this area to kind of speak on this message. But he says, uh, that Paul is the church's only apostle. And this is just like Marcionism. He says, he asked the question, is God's direction for us today found in Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, or in Hebrews? God's specific directions for the church are found predominantly in the 13 epistles that God used Paul to pen for the church age. All right, and of course we know what those are. And then he says, Jesus preached the gospel of the kingdom during his earthly ministry. He instructed his apostles and disciples to preach the same gospel. No Bible believing preacher today preaches the kingdom or the gospel of the kingdom. He preaches instead the gospel of the grace of God. All right. So now we've just been uh, accused, if you will, of not being Bible believing preachers. Okay. Because uh, I, for one, I want to teach the gospel of the kingdom. I want to do what Jesus did, not necessarily what Paul did. I want to do what Jesus did. And so he's saying that, you know, I and probably you as well are not Bible-believing preachers, okay, because we're teaching some other gospel. And they, isn't that what we hear? You're teaching some other gospel, Doug. How, how can you do this? And he goes on, he says, there's a big difference between the gospel of the kingdom and the gospel of the grace of God. They differ in their main message. The former talks of a king reigning, while the latter speaks about trusting in the Savior who has sacrificed himself by shedding his blood on the cross of Calvary. The kingdom gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, will go back into effect after the church age. That's after the so-called rapture, uh, the preacher rapture. And he says that most of the Bible is not for the believer. Paul is a standard of doctrine and not Jesus. Oh, man, I just, I, you know, I, I want to just, you know, cover my ears and run for cover. Um, he says the key to application, so long as particular scriptures do not contradict the apostle Paul's explicit instructions to the Paulism is what I'm talking about here, man. This, this, yeah. Paul trumps that's, everything. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. So as long as it doesn't, doesn't contradict Paul, then they can have church application. He's, so by determining who our spokesman is, we will know where to go to find our instructions for living today. Unquestionably, our spokesman is the Apostle Paul. That's according to Dr. Douglas Stauffer. Okay. And he even gives us some really cool graphics to drive home this point, all right? So you can see here, you've got the Old Testament, you got Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, Joshua, Samuel, David, Solomon, there before the cross, all right? And then we have the readiness of the Gospels, Matthew to John, okay? These are not for us either. And then we have the tribulation until the second coming of Jesus. These are not for us either, the, all of those books, you know, Revelation, Hebrews, etc. those are not for us. And he says, here, we are here, right? This is the little dot on the map. We're here. The church age, Romans to Philemon, these are the only books that apply to the church insofar as doctrine is concerned, all right? And, I mean, it's just, oh, my goodness, right? Paul uh, is the, the spokesperson to the church, and if it contradicts Paul's teachings, it cannot be church doctrine. But notice what our Arrhenius said, okay, Arrhenius, way back um, uh, third or fourth century. He says, with, with regard to those Marcionites 
who alleged that Paul alone knew the truth and that to him the mystery was manifested by revelation. Let Paul himself convict them when he says that no, that one and the same God wrought in Peter for the apostolate uh, of the circumcision and in himself for the Gentiles. So, uh, so you know, so there you have it. Uh, Arrhenius would, would truly rebuke such foolish teaching. Uh, and, and I use that word very selectively, okay, because this is the nonsense that has overtaken the church, and we're so deep into it, we don't even know what we're talking about. We don't realize the real source of this. And even when confronted with this, and I've confronted various pastors on this, because they've confronted me in no, uns on no uncertain terms, telling me I'm, you know, well, they're basically saying I'm going to hell, I'm leading people, to, leading people astray and leading them to hell, I'm putting them under the law. And I'm like, well, what do you do with this? And they're like, oh, that's not me. That's no, no, that's that's no, no, that's different. That's and convenient. Like, well, that is so convenient. Just to just to, because we can't reconcile this over here, we might as well just cut it out because this doesn't belong to us. That's too convenient to, yep. to do that. Yeah, absolutely. You know, but when when once you see the roots of of, of where this came from, that it's coming from Marcion, that. Um, <laughs> You're like, whoa, this is really scary stuff. And, you know, I guess what I'm really concerned about is, well, two things. You know, I, I, the, you know, I don't know entirely what that's going to mean for somebody's eternity. I don't, you know, I'll let God be the judge, but I don't think it's going to be a good thing, okay? At the very least, they will be the least in the kingdom, as Jesus said. You know, whoever teaches against the law and teaches men to not keep it will be considered least in the kingdom. So at the very you know, the, the worst that, I mean, I guess, I suppose from that perspective, you'll be the least. And that's not a great thing. All right. But, but there's also a here and now, um, there's a here and now loss of blessing. And when we don't follow the things that God has told us to do, you know, not even thinking about the afterlife, but just right now, we're missing the good things that God has for us. And that's really unfortunate. You know, that's really unfortunate that uh, we miss out on so many wonderful blessings that God would have for us. If we would just follow him and just, you know, submit and say, okay, Lord, I'm going to trust it. What you're saying is real. And, and I, and, and then you, and as you walk and you start to do it and you're like, this really is good. You know, I mean, I started keeping the Sabbath. I don't know how many years ago. It wasn't really that long. I mean, really, like really keeping it. It's probably like four or five years ago that I truly started faithfully keeping the Sabbath. And, you know, at first I'm like, oh, I don't have to do this. I guess I just could do it. Um, maybe it was a few more years than that. But, you know, again, it, I have not been doing this super long. And, but as I do it, I'm like, wow, this is, there's really a blessing this. It's so wonderful. And, you know, and I, I used to eat pork and, you know, ham and bacon and all that stuff and, and shellfish. And, and now I don't. And, I, you know, for a while I did it because God told me not to. But now I do it because now I understand that God's instruction to me is for my good. Yeah. And I, I often like to think of it like, you know, when, you, when you're two years old, you eat your vegetables because mommy said so, right? And you do it to please mommy. But man, when you're 32, hopefully you're eating your vegetables because now you realize what mommy told you was for your good. Yeah. And you eat your vegetables because they're good for you, not because you're trying to please your mother anymore. Right. You know? And I think that's the same idea is that, yes, God did tell us to, you know, do this, don't do that. And we can start off doing it just because God said to, and you know, that's good enough for me. Okay, fine. But as you mature, you begin to realize the reason God told me to do it. Well, it's ultimately for my good. It does please him when I obey. Yes. But that's not the primary motivation. The primary motivation to obey him is because it's actually good for me. And then I'm happy. And then he's happy that I'm happy. My neighbors are happy that I'm happy. You know, my children are happy that I'm happy, right? And, and it just goes all the way around. And then we live in peace and harmony with one another. And it's everything that we've ever wanted, right? I mean, this is this brotherly love. It's this, um, you know, kumbaya moment <laughs> that we have. And that's exactly what we've all been wanting, you know? And God's like, it's all in my instructions if you'll just do it. But you keep suggesting that my instructions are terrible. And so... Yeah, of course, there's issues. So keeping the Sabbath, did you feel like uh, did you feel like you're under the a burden? Did you feel burdened down? Um, Not at all. I feel I'm the freest man in the world. Yeah. 
Because yeah. I, I, don't, I don't feel any obligation to do the dishes or any obligation to go do stuff. I'm like, I can do whatever I want today. I can just chill, you know? And it's so great to not be under that pressure of like, well, I really should get to work. You know, I really yeah. should go, you know, because, you know, and I'm self-employed, so I have to be a self-motivator, right? You know, and I'm, and, and because of that, I can always find myself working, right? And, um, and you know, and it's not all bad. I, I, I enjoy my work. But having that day when there is zero obligation and I can just, you know, I can kind of tell myself in a little conversation, hey, Doug, you don't have to work today. Oh, but I probably should do this stuff. No, you don't need to do today. God told you not to, right? You're actually under a mandate to not work. And the good news is that he promised that he would take care of you and that he will pull up the slack. You know, and I think that's the fear that we can fall into is that, well, if I don't work today, I'll get behind. I won't have enough money. I won't make the mortgage payment or the rent. I won't make all my payments. I won't keep up. I'll fall behind. And God's like, no, no, no. Trust me in this. If you will keep this day, I will give you a double portion on this day. And, and, and see, that's where ultimately what we're kind of doing is we're slapping God in the face saying, you know, God, I don't believe you. I think you're a liar. And I don't trust you to do what you said you're going to do. And so I'm going to work today because if I don't, if I don't look out for number one, nobody, nobody will. will. Yeah. And I see that mentality in a lot of people is if we trust the father, his promises will, will manifest. And, and you're right. You start to see these blessings and good things happening in your life. Uh, just continually doors opening, um, you know, but on the flip side of that, <laughs> if you're not obedient, I think you'll find that, you know, you get up Monday morning and you walk outside and your, your car's got a flat tire and you get the flat tire fixed and you get down the road and, and then, you know, your air conditioner goes out and it's 110 today. And, and it's one thing after the other that goes wrong. And, and where do we, you know, it was one of those Mondays, right? It's Monday. Everything went wrong. Really? Is it, is it that or is it how you're living? Is it, are you giving him your life? Have you surrendered over to him? Right. And, and, and starting your day out, praising him um, and, and walking in his way. Uh, because he said, if you do this, it, this, these blessings will happen. If you don't do this, well, these bad things will happen to you. You'll get sick and you'll have sores and you won't have any rain. Your crops will fail. Your animals will die. And mm -hmm. all of these bad things will happen if you don't, if you're not obedient. Uh, right. So. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's absolutely. And again, the obedience leads to peace and joy and a sense of security and ultimately love, right? I mean, you know, it, it's one thing if you have a household and you have children and, and you, you tell them that you love them and that's good, but they're going to really know that they're loved when there's peace in the house, when they know that there's security and they're not always worried about, you know, being thrown out on the street or that there's some terrible dire consequence, you know? And so I think that's part of it is that as we're obedient to our, our father and we have this, 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 this quiet sense of peace, you know, and just we're at rest, mm -hmm. we're at rest, you know? And I, I just, I don't know how to say, how to say, you know, like that is truly what the human heart is looking for. We're looking for peace. Right. We, we, we enjoy excitement and there's times for thrills and action, but we can't exist forever in that kind of environment. We have to be in this place of ultimately that we find rest and we find peace and we find uh, this tranquility because that's what our soul is looking for. And the only way to find that is in righteousness. You know, we can pursue the ways of the world and sow our wild oats and it's all exciting. And, but after a while, you get tired. After a while, you just cannot keep up with that kind of lifestyle. And, and, and you're going to then run back. And the only way to find it is in, is in righteousness and God's righteousness. And, and what we mean is not the righteousness that he dumps on you, but the righteousness that is found in walking out the lifestyle that he has prescribed. That's where we find that. And, you know, let me just say this, that, even the idea of righteousness, and we talk about Christ's righteousness, um, it's one of these, these twisted ideas that, um, that somehow, you know, Jesus takes this bucket of, of paint, paint of righteousness and he just kind of 
dumps it on you, right? And now I'm righteous because he's made me righteous. And when the father looks at me, he just sees Christ's righteousness. I mean, I've heard that sermon many times too, right? And, um, and so, you know, again, I get where they're coming from because I'm forgiven. Granted, I'm forgiven. And so I'm not having to earn his favor. I've been granted his favor. But, but God, Jesus doesn't make me righteous. He, he, he forgives me. Mm-hmm. right? That's what he does for me. And if I blow it again, he says that he is faithful and just to forgive us all of our sins, okay? But righteousness, and here, it's a really simple test. Uh, he who walks righteousness, righteously is righteous, right? That's what First John says, right? It's simple. You have to do acts, right? Uh, Micah 6, 8. He has shown you, O man, what is good and what the Lord requires of you to do justly, love mercy and walk humbly with your God. I mean, nothing has changed that it's, it's upon me to do righteously. And it's not something that happens to me. It's not something that God pushes on me. You know, and I, I used to go out on the streets. I used to do a lot of uh, street witnessing and, and I would use the Isaiah 64 uh, to tell people how unrighteous they were and they didn't have stand a chance. And if they didn't call upon God's mercy, they were done for. And so I would, I would use this passage from Isaiah 64 where, um, you know, he says that all of our righteousnesses are as filthy rags, right? And, and the word there is the same word that's being used of a, a woman's menstrual rag, you know? And so you're like, oh my gosh, that's really nasty. Okay. And, and so, the, so there's this idea that it doesn't matter what I do, God looks at my righteousness as, as filthy rags, Okay. And, and it wasn't until several years ago that I, it finally occurred to me. I'm like, oh my goodness, I've been reading that wrong this whole time. Because I was reading it that there's nothing I can, there's, I cannot uh, do anything righteous. All right? I have to just receive God's righteousness. And I realized, no, that's not what he's saying. What he's saying is that my righteousness is, as opposed to God's definition or standard of righteousness. And as you look through not only the book of Isaiah, but the book of Hosea, the book of Jeremiah, Ezekiel, all of them, what they're talking about is that Israel, specifically the 10 tribes of Israel, and, and Judah to some extent as well, but, but they were pursuing their own righteousness. They were pursuing a righteousness apart from, in contrast to God's righteousness. And what is God's righteousness? The Torah right? It's, it's, the, it's the, the instructions, the commandments, the statutes, the same statutes that God was bragging to Isaac. Hey, Abraham, your father, he listened. He obeyed my voice. He kept my charge. He kept my commandments, my statutes, and my instructions. He did these things. That is the righteousness that we're talking about. And so if I neglect and forsake that standard of righteousness, and then pursue my own definition of righteousness, then God's like, oh, that's gross. That's like filthy rags, okay? But if you follow my righteousness, then it's awesome, it's good, it's wholesome, and it leads to life. And if a man will do them, he will live by them. Mm -hmm. You know, so these are just some of the incredible confusions that are out there, sadly. I agree, brother. Um completely and uh you know i don't, I don't know uh how much further in in uh, downward spiral that the body can go in in some of the things you know the, the scriptures are clear that that the most high is going to send a strong delusion or strong delusions and, and we're seeing that in all kinds of beliefs today whether people are arguing about the shape of the planet which is a complete distraction a trick of satan uh, to to get us off of what's important, and so you have all these things that pop up, uh, and this this very old thing from Marcion. It's not a new thing that that we're seeing now. Uh, the, the comment I heard on the, on the guy's YouTube video is this is a this is something new. It's underground right now. It's an underground kind of thing. Uh, no, it's been around, and it was started almost two thousand years ago with with Marcion. And uh, it's still alive today. It's this hyper uh, Paulism uh, and any anti 
anything old or Tanakh or anything, will they say Jewish? It's all classic Marcion, and and I'm just uh, I'm I'm just blown away that folks haven't just tried to backtrack that and connect the dots in where this has originated, uh, and 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 you know come to any any rational conclusion. Um, well, we've we've been so stuck in our own traditions, and you know one thing that understanding Martianism has helped me is, um, you know, even the very gospel or let's, let's call it the, uh, the, the new covenant itself. Uh, that was something that was rather uh, mysterious to me. Uh, you know, even though it was in the Bible, it was clearly there in the pages. It's in Jeremiah 31, 31, behold, the days are coming when I'll make a new covenant, right? You have that same, uh, that very same passage is, is, is copied word for word in Hebrews 8, 8. Right. And, um, and of course, Jesus says, this is the blood of the new covenant. Right. Um, and, and so you, you know, we see all these things, but because there's been this Marcionistic uh, ghost, the spirit of Marcionism that's been over us for so many years, you know, I, I couldn't see those things and, until I think again, God just started to open up my eyes and what I get excited about, is I really do believe that we are approaching the last days and, and not because of, you know, some of the, the, the typical telltale signs, you know, that we're seeing an increase in earthquakes and we're seeing uh, weird technology and, you know, and all that stuff is interesting and it, it has a place. But what I get really excited about is the, the bigger message of the Bible, the, the overwhelming message of the Bible that has also been overlooked because probably because Marcionism has blinded us to the reality of this. And what is that overwhelming reality? It's this story of this family, this very dysfunctional family. All right. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, you've heard of them. All right. Jacob had 12 sons. All right. And then those 12 sons became the basis that the 12 tribes, which would become the, the nation of Israel, right? That nation of Israel entered into a marriage contract with God at Mount Sinai, based on grace, where he again gave him his standard of righteousness, his standard of how to live your life, called the Torah, the instructions. It was not the first time that mankind had ever been exposed to this. Uh, God ex started exposing mankind to his ways of doing things and his righteousness on the very first day, right? Or, you know, day six to be exact. Um, and, and, and guess what? Day seven. What, was, what did he teach them on day seven? The fourth commandment, right? Here's the Sabbath, guys. I just made this thing for you. It's pretty cool, huh? You know? So that was the first lesson they got is the fourth commandment. Wow. Right? And, and so, again, we, we see all these things. We see the Ten Commandments really throughout uh, the book of Genesis. Somehow Joseph knows that he's not to commit adultery with Potiphar's wife. How does he know that? He says, Hi, I can't do this against your husband and against God. How does he know that? I mean, it's really amazing. So there's already an understanding of God's instructions. But what happens then is uh, Israel at Mount Sinai very quickly becomes an adulterous wife. Uh, she cheats on her husband. She goes after this false god, the, the golden calf. And God's like, you know what? According to the law, I should destroy her. Uh, listen, Moses, I'll, I'll get rid of her and we'll start over with you. No, God, don't do that. Blah, blah. Okay. And so, you know, he does it. So he goes on. For 700 years, it's a strained relationship. And we even see in 932 that the kingdom, the 12 tribes, breaks into two. In fact, they've always, they'd always been two. They always were referred to as the house of Judah and the house of Israel. And so after Solomon's, you know, bad ways, and then his stupid son, uh, Rehoboam, uh, the northern ten tribes say, you know what? We're out of here. We have no inheritance in the house of Jesse. We're out. We're done. All right? And so they go. God gives the kingdom to Jeroboam. He says, look, you're now the king of Israel. Okay, there you go. And as a result, they go from bad to worse. And God says in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 3, in the entire book of Hosea uh, and other places, I'm divorcing you. It's over I'm no longer your God. You're no longer my people. 
I will not have mercy on the house of Israel any longer, but I will have mercy on the house of Judah because of the promises I made to David. And so house of Israel, we're done. I'm divorcing you. Get out of my house. All right. And as she's leaving, I know <laughs> as she's leaving, God's like, you know what? But I still like you. <laughs> yeah. I still got that soft spot in my heart for you. And I'm going to bring you back to me one day and I will betroth you to me in righteousness. And you will no longer call upon the Baalim. You will call upon me. You'll call me Ishi, my man, my husband. No longer. You will say Baal. Right? But not now because I'm mad at you. Yeah, because I'm really tired. Get out of my sight. Get out of my sight and come yeah. back later. I'll, yeah. I'll come after you later. I yeah. see that too. Um, yeah, exactly. Right? And so the question, this big mystery of, oh my goodness, how can he bring this adulterous, divorced wife back into rightful relationship with him? How can he possibly do that and not break his own, his own instructions? I saw your presentation on that, and it clicked for me, and I was like, that is it. Yeshua came, he gave his life so that he could reconcile us, he, us back to him in, in, in that way, because you're right. He could not violate his own law, uh, which was he had to put her away. Mm -hmm. but, but marry her again, this is that mystery, Paul. Cannot, you know, get, he's like, wait a minute, Israel's divorced. What is, it, what, what is going on here? This great mystery is that the fact that, that the father is bringing back Israel, after he said no. Uh, so it's almost like he's contradicting himself, but it's not that way. It's, it's, he put it away for a while. That's right. That's right. And, and so when we understand that and we see that, and then we go back to the prophets and we see all these, these references, you know, talking about an adulterous wife, uh, you know, a very powerful passage is Isaiah 54. All right where he says, sing, O barren, you who have not born, break forth into singing and cry aloud. You have not labored with child. For more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married woman, says the Lord. Enlarge the place of your tents, etc." And he says, um, do not fear, for you will not be ashamed, neither be disgraced, for you will not be put to shame. For you will forget the shame of your youth, and you will not remember the reproach of your widowhood, for your maker is your husband, the Lord of hosts is his name, and your redeemer is the Holy One of Israel. He is called the God of the whole earth. For the Lord has called you like a woman forsaken and grieved in spirit, like a youthful wife, when you were refused, says your God. For a mere moment I have forsaken you, but with great mercies I will gather you. All right, so what's he getting at? Well, what's interesting is when we understand that God said very clearly in Hosea chapter 1, I will no longer have mercy on the house of Israel, but I will have mercy on the house of Judah. And then he went and divorced the northern, the northern kingdom, the ten tribes. Um, so that's all the tribes except for Judah, Levi, essentially, and Benjamin. Okay, Levi is kind of a a half C, right? He doesn't right. Totally, totally count. But essentially, Judah and Benjamin and some Levites in there. So he divorces uh, the other 10 tribes. He says, I am not your God. You're not my people. Get out. And he divorced them. Now, it's interesting that Paul quotes from this very same passage in Galatians chapter 4, right? And isn't it interesting that he would bring our attention to this very same passage. It's almost like Paul gets it, right? <laughs> yes. Yes, Paul does get it. That's what's so powerful. In fact, he really gets it in Romans chapter 9. And uh, he says in verse uh, 24, he says, uh, Even us whom he called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. As he says in Hosea, I will call them my people. Call who? The Gentiles. Okay. I will call them my people who were not my people and her beloved who was not beloved. And it shall come to pass in the place where it was said to them, you are not my people. Who did he say that to? To the Northern kingdom. There they shall be called sons of the living God. 
And he goes on, uh, Isaiah also cries out concerning Israel, not Judah, but Israel. Though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, the remnant will be saved. All right, and, and so now with this understanding of what he's getting at, and let me just say that Peter makes the same uh, statement in 1 Peter chapter 2. He says, uh, who were once not a people, but now are the people of God who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. God spoke those very things to the house of Israel in Hosea chapter 1. In Hosea chapter 1, he says, God said, call his name Lo-Ami, for you are not my people, and I will not be your God. Right? So he's talking to these northern tribes. And so now Peter gets it. Paul gets it. What they're understanding is that the Gentiles coming back in are the remnant of the house of Israel. And who were back. they at that time? Let's, let's, let's clear that up for everybody. Is they'd gone north into to those areas above, the Asia Minor and into Greece. Um, you know, in Daniel's statue, you got uh, Nebuchadnezzar, Syria, and Greece. Greece was uh, under, under Alexander the Great had ruled that area. And one of the things about Alexander the Great was he liked to assimilate people into his kingdom. He didn't just, just he didn't destroy you and change your name like Nebuchadnezzar would do, change your identity. He integrated you in, right? You became Greek. You became uncircumcised. You became... Well, it goes back even further. It goes back to the, the Assyrian kings, right? Mm -hmm. um, so in Second Second Kings chapter 17... Uh, it says, therefore, the Lord was very angry with Israel and removed them from his sight. There was none left but the tribe of Judah alone. So there again, we see this very clear contrast between Israel and Judah. And, uh, of course, you know, Judah had their issues as well. But he says, uh, the Lord rejected all the descendants of Israel, afflicted them, and delivered them in the hand of plunders until he cast them from his sight. For he tore Israel from the house of David, and they made Jeroboam the son of Nebat king. Then Jeroboam drove Israel from following the Lord and made them commit a great sin. Or a great sin. For the children of Israel walked in all the sins of Jeroboam, which he did. They did not depart from them until the Lord removed Israel out of his sight, as he had said by all his servants, the prophets. So Israel was carried away from their own land to Assyria, as it is to this day. Yeah. Then the king of Assyria brought people from Babylon, Kuta, Ava, Hamat, and Sepharvaim and placed them in the cities of Samaria instead of the children of Israel. All right, so, so here we see that he took the people of Samaria, etc., and he removed them, and then he put other people in their place. All right, so he, he took them away. He took them far away. He removed them from his sight. And uh, God says he removed them from his sight. So the, the king of, Is of uh, Assyria took them away and placed them in other lands. And yes, they were assimilated. Now, I, I think that definitely some of them went north. Some of them went, uh, went west. But we, we, um, uh, I think some of them went east as well. And, you know, it gets a little bit, a little murkier as, you know, the further out we go. But we do have these very clear statements that they have gone all over the place. In fact, Daniel says this very thing in Daniel chapter 9. Daniel's confessing the sins of his people. He says, we've rebelled and committed iniquity. He says, um, O Lord, righteousness belongs to you. But to us, shame of face, as it is this day, to the men of Judah, so we know who those people are, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and all Israel, those near and those far off in all the countries to which you have driven them because of the unfaithfulness which they have committed against you. So let's think about where were the inhabitants of Judah? Well, some of them were still in Judah, all right? And, uh, you know, some never left. Uh, the, but, but many of the inhabitants of Judah and, of course, Jerusalem were taken captive by Nebuchadnezzar. They were taken where? to Babylon. No other place. They were taken to Babylon. All right? So when, when Daniel says this, 
the people of Judah are either in Judah or they're in Babylon, or potentially when he says this, they may have, some of them also gone to Egypt because we see that in the book of Jeremiah as well. But otherwise, that's where they stayed. They didn't go anywhere. Uh, they weren't, you know, in all these other countries. And so then he says, and all Israel, because he's still making a distinction mm -hmm. between Judah and Israel. And so now you have all Israel, those near and those far off in all the countries. And then when you, when you, when you hear that, let me then take you to, this gets really exciting, to Ephesians chapter 2. Uh, Paul talks about this, this uh, commonwealth of Israel. He talks about uh, we who were the first to believe, uh, speaking of, I believe, the, the Jews, the, the Judah. And then he says in verse 11, therefore remember that you, once Gentiles, okay, that is a non-Jew, who are uh, called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision made in the flesh by hands. At that time, you were without Christ, being aliens from the common wealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope without God in the world. Why? Because God said, you're not my people. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. He uses the same phrase to speak about these Gentiles, these people of the nations who are far off, far off from where? Far off from where they used to be, right? And, and so now, because they were not God's people, um, and he did not have mercy on them, and they just were scattered into the nations, into the Gentiles. They became one with the Gentiles. And so now they were far off, but now they can come in and they can be part of what? They can be part of the common wealth of Israel. It's really amazing when it all just comes back together. And, you know, so, you know, just kind of sum it up. Marcionism has clouded our vision so that we couldn't see it. But once we kind of get rid of that, then, you know, the scales fall off and we're like, oh, oh, I can see this other thing now. And I can see this mystery that has been hidden from my eyes, even though it was in plain sight, but I could not see it. You know, in fact, I tell you, the, one of the biggest, most humbling revelations to me was I was reading through Romans chapter 11, where Paul says that blindness in part has happened to the Gentiles, or to the Jews, excuse me, to the Jews, or, um, sorry, to Israel, has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles comes in. All right. And so I used to read that. Well, you know, the, the, the Jews, they can't see, you know, they just can't see. And then I was thinking about it. I'm like, wait a second, Israel. Israel. I'm like, oh my goodness, wait a second. I think I'm part of Israel. And then I'm like, oh, that means I can't see. And then I was like, oh Lord, I'm sorry. You know, there I was thinking that, well, you know, we Christians can see, but you Jews can't see a thing, right? Because you've been blinded. And, you know, and they have, but so have we. That's the, sh the shocking and scary thing about it. We well, the stumbling block was for both houses too. You know, the stumbling yeah. block uh, that, uh, that that's right. inserted. Um, mm -hmm. It's amazing because I, I I saw the same thing. Um, this the fullness of the, of the Gentiles coming in, um, and the great awakening that it seems like it happening uh, happened for a lot of people in around two thousand nine, two thousand ten. Um, and then you go and start calculating what uh, actually was prophesied in Ezekiel four. Uh, we've run the course of that curse, um, and now what what happens? The scale starts falling off. We start realizing. Wait a minute. Um, I'm not who I thought I was. Mm -hmm. I used to think I'm this, this group called the church, but wait a minute. We're yeah. actually these Northern tribes. And mm -hmm. when you do the math, brother, they, it, you can find out from the Bible that it roughly there's about 7 million Israelis that went into Diaspora in uh, 722. And they were the final ones that went out. Now, mm -hmm. over, over 2,740 years, the exponential growth of that many people is insane. We're talking about hundreds of billions of people. That's right. Uh, even with the world wars and Holocaust mm -hmm. and all that we've had, we still have hundreds of billions of people that are the remnant, the descendants of mm -hmm. um, these tribes. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the Holy Spirit gave me an image of how to, how to convey that. And that was taking a pitcher of water and ice and dropping 
10 drops of blue dye in that and giving it one stir to, to represent movement. Yep. After a few cycles of that, what happens is that blue encapsulates everything. It becomes all blue. And yep. so that's why we see the scriptures say, go to the four corners and mm -hmm. gather in my harvest, because that's what's happened. They've, we have literally filled every country from the darkest of the darkest person to the most Asian of, of people and everything in between. You are Israel. Mm -hmm. And this makes sense that, you know, that, you know, you, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. But then you have, Yeshua con contradicting that, saying, I only came for the lost sheep of Israel. Well, mm -hmm. this is a mystery, uh, it seems, because um, this grafting in, the Father was including the whole world in this, this diaspora that he did with Israel, grafting in the world through uh, these tribes. Um, yep. I, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I was hoping I could pull up a... Um a little graphic I had. I, I can't remember which slide it's in, but, um, but yeah, I, I, it, just to underscore what you're saying uh, of, um, you know, these millions of people going out, uh, an interesting number. I, I uh, have a friend, Doug Krieger, who calculated about 10 million. So, uh, you know, somewhere between seven to 10 million uh, house of Israel people, uh, Northern kingdom were sent into diaspora uh, obviously, some of them were killed, but some of them were not. You know, they were just taken away. And uh, and then what happens after that? Well, people do what people do, right? They get married and they populate. Find, they grow. They find, yeah, they find a pretty girl and they settle down, and you know, and and uh, and they don't care if she's Israelite or not because they didn't care in the first place, right? And so you know, they're not trying to look for somebody who's of the same lineage. And no, you just you're taken away sometimes forcefully as a slave and maybe you're given freedom, but you know, you do what you just do what people do and you have, you set on have, have a, a wife and children and, and that's what happens. And so uh, anyway, I wanted to just uh, share some um, something that I found, which is if you go back just 40 generations, okay. And by generation, this would be from parent to child. Okay. So, so take, assume, you know, every generation's roughly 20 to 25 years uh, in, in that sense, okay? Um, so if you go back 40 generations from parent to child or child to parent, whatever, then you're gonna, you go back about 400 years. It's not really that much. Um, but you would have potentially, uh, according to the numbers, one trillion people uh, in, in your ancestry. Now, of course, that's ridiculous, right? There are not even a trillion people uh, in all of history, according to the best estimates. And just, you know. but, but what it shows is not that you'd have a trillion different unique people, but that the, um, the relationships become overlapping so that you have you know, relatives and this person is related to this person, right? That's what that, that number that becomes rather absurd but that's what it shows is that when you go back, you're, you're just, you're running into relatives all over the place. Yeah. All right. And so then if we take it forward, right, if we go from these 7 million or 10 million people that were taken out and then the potential for them to then uh, for their seed to then uh, literally go around the world does not really even seem that difficult at that point. Mm. Right. And so I think that's kind of what we're getting at here is that, you know, yeah that uh yes that that seed could go out and yeah. and for me you know that i find that very just exciting i guess because you know i see that uh god has done this amazing work where he's brought in far more people than we could have ever imagined you know it's not it's not just that well god's got this plan for the jews and then he's got this plan for everybody else you know but no i mean he's really um He's done it in such a way that he's brought in the entire nations. And, uh, you know, sure, we're all kind of mixed, but, you know, he, he's brought in so many people. And, you know, he says in Isaiah 49, 6, indeed, he says, it is too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel. I will also give you as a light to the Gentiles, to the nations, that you should be my salvation 
to the ends of the earth, right? So, you know, when, when you think of it, you're like, wow, he's, you know, the seed has gone out. You know, God says through your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed, right? And so this seed literally has gone out uh, just by, you know, basic reproduction, uh, it's gone out and it's been commingled and then commingled again. And, and the illustration that you're using of, you know, dropping that little bit of uh, dye into some water and then you stir it around and, well, you know where it went, right? But can you ever get it out? No, no. it's, it, no. it's too late. It's become a, a mixture. You can't, right. you can't undo it. And uh, that's what we're looking at, you know? And, and, you know, I think also when you, when you think about even at the, the first marriage covenant, you had a mixed multitude that was present, yeah. right? You had these people that were not blood relatives, but they came out of Egypt and they, they, uh, they um, became part of the Commonwealth of Israel because they were at Sinai, because they entered into a relationship with God. So, so even if it were not a purely genetic thing, right. uh, you'd still have people that can come in just by basis of faith. That's right. And so, you know, either way, you know, no matter how you slice this cake, it, it still <laughs> tastes delicious. That's and right. um, that's the exciting, really exciting part. And um, great stuff, yeah. brother. We've gone two hours. I, I won't uh, ask you, I know you got plans today. Uh, if there's anything you want to say to conclude, uh, I appreciate you joining me today and, and helping, uh, you know, convey this message and helping uh, people to understand exactly what's going on with Marcionism, why we see this hyperpole. Um, uh, ism going on and what exactly it means. So I want to thank you for, uh, for helping clear that up. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's really been a pleasure.